obviously not a particularly representative group of people to turn up on a Sunday for something about housing. You're obviously bothered about housing. And I'm going to guess that you're probably not that bothered about the rich. Um, <laughs> but, but what I want to start off talking about is the rich and the problems of the rich and the not quite so rich and the sort of almost rich and then the kind of in the middle because I think it really matters to understand why we are where we are now and where we're likely to be going in the future. And the key point about this is just trying to get ahead of it because currently 90-95% of people in Britain would trust our elected politicians to begin to sort things out. Maybe it becomes obvious that there's a problem. The politicians promise to build lots of houses. They promise to keep interest rates down. They promise to keep people off the streets. They might not do a good job of it, but they kind of sound credible. <coughs> if things get worse, the way that things may well get worse, that particular story is going to be harder to sustain. And in those circumstances, the opportunity to do things a bit differently can suddenly open up. And one big problem in Britain, I think we've had compared to other countries in Europe, is that when the opportunity to do something different has opened up, we've often gone the wrong way because somebody else has taken that opportunity and moved it the other way. The classic case of this was in the 1970s when there was a whole series of crises in rich countries, and a series of rich countries chose not to let those rich get richer, uh, we didn't, we fell apart as far as the opposition is concerned and we allowed the rich to get richer in the 80s and 90s and the noughties and you can look back and say well what went wrong in the 70s so that we didn't go in the direction of some other countries which have been much more equal in their society since then or you could look at the crisis of 2007, 2008 uh, where now in hindsight we can see that one group of people did take advantage of it. Uh, in particular landlords, although I honestly do not think, as I'm sure you can tell me, I don't think a group of them actually got together and met in a room like this in say summer 2008 and said look we can make a killing. But it's almost as if they did when you see what, what's happening. I'm going to start because you can tell by looking at me, even before I open my mouth, that I'm a Guardian reader. <laughs> I'm going to start because, because we were talking earlier about British society and how political it is. Incidentally, in, in other countries, it's much harder to make judgments about people just by looking at them and hearing them. In a more equal society, when they do things differently in the 70s, people come out sounding much more silly. The Guardian yesterday. Uh, Patrick Collinson, money editor of The Guardian. So you've got to think middle class, middle aged people reading this. What they learned reading it is that if you'd invested in buy-to-let property in 1996, when it first became possible to invest in buy-to-let property, £1,000 invested then would have turned into £13,000 in real terms by now. That's a 16% gain every year on your investment. There is no other way of getting a 16% every year on average for that amount, that length of time, other than investing in property. And suddenly the Guardian has decided to tell all its middle-aged, middle-class readers, let alone the Telegraph and the Times and so on, that essentially if they're worried about their future, their pension, their inheritance, they really should be thinking about getting into buy to let. That's kind of, how, kind of how bad things have got. And that's the state of the crisis we're at. And it's a very, very odd time at the moment. So when I was finishing that book off, on the last day I had the proofs in January for the book, the book was going to end with a little quote from Karl Marx. It doesn't end now with a quote from Karl Marx, that quote is still in there. It now ends with a quote from Staples, the estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> because, because, of, you know, if you were, if, if you couldn't make this up, you couldn't a few years ago have said that we'd get to this situation. Staples, the estate agent, have been running a research program looking at what happens to property in Britain, who gets to own it, who's doing well, who's doing badly. They've got access to the individual records at postcode level for mortgages, and they told the Financial Times, who published this on January 18th this year, that in the last four years, private landlords have made a net gain of 245 billion. 
in their well. They've made that net gain partly because the property they've bought, which tends to be in London and the South East, has gone up in value, and partly because they can charge much higher rent than they were, just, they were charging four or five years ago, as more and more people are desperate to especially get housed in this part of the country because it's the part of the country where the jobs are. As landlords get in more and more rent, as they evict people on average once a year, that money, that cash in their hands, because it doesn't cost as much to keep the property up, means that they can buy another property and another property and another property, increasing the prices of the property um, and then making it harder for people to buy who might have bought it, then have to rent, and so on and so on. And that's, that's just occurred in the last four years. The average wealth of people with a mortgage, I didn't tell you I was going to worry quite a bit what you were going to talk about, I'm going to worry about the top half of the 99% here. The average wealth of people who've got a mortgage has actually declined, I think, by over 100 billion. Because people with mortgages, um, there's been an exit from the elderly, ones coming in at the bottom have had to borrow far, far more to be able to buy a property if they can possibly buy one. And so they're in greater debt. That entire group of mortgage holders, which is getting smaller, is also getting poorer. And that's really strange. In general, over time, mortgage holders get richer because they pay off their mortgage and the property increases in value. That, that, that hasn't happened over the last four years. And the last one of those groups who own or are buying property are the people who own outright, and they've only seen a small increase in the value of their property because most people who own outright don't own outright in London. They own outright in places like Wales, where the price has just carried on falling since 2008. So you've got a crisis at the top of society, let alone a crisis at the bottom. You've got a very small number of people doing well. The Institute of Fiscal Studies produced a report last year showing that since the crash, the reductions in income and benefits to people way at the top of the income scale means that we've had a reduction in income inequality for the 99%, taking us back to when John Major was Prime Minister. It's actually become more equal. We are all in it together more, except for <coughs> the 1%. <laughs> uh, the 1% have carried on moving away so fast that when you see figures for the average 10%, it looks as if they're doing okay. So take out the 1% and they're not. Now, it's, it's easy not to have any sympathy for people in the top 10%, um, but don't make the mistake of ignoring them because the top 10% are incredibly powerful. They basically tend to run the country. And it's very hard, I think, to run a country when your top 10% are largely annoyed and feeling poorer for most of them. What Margaret Thatcher did, in effect, was the opposite. When Thatcher came into power in 1979, the top 10%, apart from the top 1%, had two and a half times average income. They had two and a half times what most people got. By the time Margaret Thatcher left power, they had three times average income. Now she was a member, well not just of the 1%, but of the 0.1%. So she took the 10% with her, take the 10% with you, and you really can screw the country and get away with it. What's happening now is an attempt by a party which is largely at the top actual members of the 1% and a coalition which is largely members of the 1% to try to do this without increasing the living standards of those other people who are part of that top group, hoping that there's enough division within the 99% that people won't get their act together at all, which is entirely possible. Um, and it's possible for a very small group of people to carry on benefiting. Landlords are about 2% of the population. This is a shelter estimate. <coughs> At least half of them are not doing very well as landlords. They are incredibly amateur. Their tenants are even worse, of course, but they fail to make much money. But of course, the other half of landlords are the ones making that 245 billion. So they're some of the richest people. The other richest people are the bankers who've seen their wages increase progressively year on year and who buy property with it. Because what else do you do with the money? What do you do with all this money if you're at the top? Where do you put it that's safe? And currently the idea is it's safe here. 
and that's why we're getting the buying up of London in particular. And once you're buying it purely as a safe place to put your money, housing somebody in it is, is pretty incidental. You know, it might make you feel better if you have tenants, but you're not necessarily doing it to make that much money because if you've got prime property, say in the top third of London property market, the increase in the value of that property is, is far greater than anything you're going to make out of the rent in the piece of living. So that's the current mess we're in. The reason, the reason to be cheerful is it is patently obvious this can't continue. Um, the example I like to give is, is Kenston and Chelsea. And you can tell the odd things are happening in Kenston and Chelsea when a few years ago the average life expectancy in that borough went up by more than one year a year, and then again by more than one year in a year. You know, so women were going from average life expectancy of 90 to 91 and a half, 91 and a half to 93. If that carried on, the residents of Kenton and Chelsea would never die. I'm a very odd person. This is what I look, look to for optimism, all to know, to know that these are strange times something very unusual is occurring and it can't carry on occurring forever. If you look at London investment in property and the price is going up, it isn't that hard to roll it forward a year, another year, say 10 years, 15 years. And I challenge any of you to tell me if you do roll the current increases forward 10 or 15 years, who's going to buy them? Who's actually going to buy the property of the people at the top? because half the world's super rich have already bought property in this city and they really only want to buy, although they, they are stretching where they'll buy in generally in certain parts. The rest of the world's super rich are not so rich and it's fashion. It can change where, where the place to buy is. The, the only way I can see the London housing bubble sustaining for another 10 or 15 years is immigration. And it's not any old immigration, because I've said we haven't got enough of the super rich, it's immigration of aliens coming from another planet <laughs> with bars of platinum, <laughs> which is the only way you'd have enough money to buy it. So you can tell that this is going to end at some point, but you don't know when it's going to end. And why are people still in this? If you project that far forward and can see that it can't carry on, well, they're still in it because they think they're going to be clever enough to get out of it a year before it crashes. That's what, mm. that's what they're doing. But they know there's going to be a crash. They're not that stupid. Their financial advisors are not that stupid. The, the problem for us in London is that when the rich bought gold, they didn't need gold for that much. When they bought fine art, okay, it might surprise you to see the fine art, but it's not so bad. When they buy property, they really are impinging on your life. Even if they buy <coughs> property in a borough you might never have thought you'd have lived in, by emptying that borough out, the population of Kenton Chelsea has gone down. They've squeezed the people who would have lived there, which are members of the House of Lords, who now complain they can't get into the House of Lords. <laughs> they squeeze out the neighbouring boroughs. They push out further. And all these people pushing out are very inefficient at using housing. They're used to having a lot of space. So as they move out, they don't use it as efficiently as the people who used to live in that area. And so you end up with an enormous housing crisis, despite the fact we haven't had a demolition of housing because the very rich don't use housing particularly efficiently. Now, because just to end up on the signs of things ending, I mean, apart from anything else, if you think about when the bubble will burst, half our children, at least half our girls in this country, go to university. Um, by the age of 18. They all have a £9,000 tuition fee turning into a £50,000 debt and a large number of this half of the population would normally look to be buying a property in 10 or 15 years time but they're going to be carrying a £50,000 debt with them already. You can begin to see where the unravelling is coming from. Current government policy is all about holding the market up. In the, in the light of all of this. So if you were to look, I was asked to look at the last budget and the one before it on budget day, and I just remember going through thinking, why are they doing these policies? The majority of policies that both the last budget and the one before are about 
confidence in the market to keep the market high. So the help the buy scheme is to encourage banks to lend to people that banks would themselves would want to lend to. And it's only, <laughs> only to keep it going to an election. Uh, we collectively are going to be underwriting 130 billion of mortgages under Help to Buy to keep confidence in it. <coughs> George Osborne has said he's now thinking of extending it to 2020, um, but it's about the election. Mm. Let me just end, because I'm sure I've used up my figures about why it's the election or, or how they can remember this. In the early 90s, there was a lovely graphic. I'm afraid, again, it was in The Guardian, about 1994. And it was a map of London, and it was a map of all the boroughs that the Conservatives had lost control of, which was the outer boroughs that they lost control of then. And the map was titled The Incredible Shrinking Tory. <coughs> and you've got to think, I'm only a year or so older than George Osborne. So young George Osborne probably wasn't reading The Guardian at that time, but he grew up in the Conservative Party. The worst thing that happened to them after their glorious years of Thatcher and their not so glorious of Major was a housing slump in 89, negative equity in 92, 93, and the middle class is abandoning the Conservative Party in the general election of 1997. So if you are interested in how do you win, or at least get a coalition in a general election you know, you know it's going to hold next May, you do everything you can to make half the population think they're getting richer and they're going to be okay. Why does this matter for you lot? So the likelihood of things going badly wrong the day after the election is very, very high, let alone before it, if people begin uh, to think what's happened. The danger of the thing to look out for is that what will then happen, um, I should say this point, I'm not a member of any political party and I am sadly disappointed in the party of my upbringing, um, which is Labour. But the danger is, any housing slump will be blamed on Labour, or the fear that they might have been voted in. Um, and you can see how this will, this will all be used. So it becomes very, very important to say now <coughs> this is unsustainable, entirely predictable, spending money we don't have, irresponsible economics, it's actually the same language that the coalition are using to talk about the last government, should be being used now to talk about the coalition's housing policy. And for me, this is so important that I haven't talked at all about social housing, council housing, homelessness, much about private renting apart from landlords. Because I honestly think there is a chance to have a much, much bigger coalition of people who have an interest in this. As long as they realise that this was foreseen, is known, was preventable, is being stoked up. It's not just about you and your own personal ability to house yourselves. In the interest of trying to get an outright majority, the major part of the coalition government is stoking up a crash that could have very, very bad implications because we're not necessarily all going to get better housed in the aftermath of a crash. And some people are going to get very, very badly burned. If you want to have a look, you don't have to look far. You just look around the whole of you apart, apart from us. So you look at Cyprus and the banking loans. You look at Greece. You look at Portugal. You look at Spain. You look at Italy. You can look up at Iceland. All far easier, just go and look at Ireland. It's not very far. And if you want to think about positive things that can be done for the bulk of people who are housed, this is not just some more radical solutions. You can look at the land packs in Ireland that have actually come in. People said it wouldn't work. It's actually come in. People are now being taxed 1.8% per year on the value of their property, <coughs> or 0.25% if it's worth over a million euros. Land packs have come in, which will um, get people to use property more efficiently. And it's happened in Ireland. And we don't talk about what's happened in Ireland, partly because the vested interest in trying to keep things as they are is so very, very high. And that's, that's what you're up against. But when you worry about the vested interest, don't think it's all inevitable. <laughs> nothing's going to get nothing's going to get better. We we are headed for something that looks pretty bad. It would be our fault if we don't say that, and if we don't have suggestions to say what should happen in the event of that crash. And the first thing I would do, and this is for people with mortgages, rest on the rest, I would have the right to sell, which we already have in law, but extend it so that you don't get evicted, you can't pay the mortgage anymore, 
when the interest rates go up, that you can become a tenant in the property that you were trying to buy, and you can choose your landlord, you can choose the housing association that gets that property, so that you're not evicted and put on the street. That kind of policy is fanciful, except in the situation where tens of thousands of families may be facing eviction, and it's not impossible to see what their circumstances are, where tens of thousands of families are facing eviction, and then suddenly, people who are worrying about housing and squats in London will have common, a lot in common with people who read the Daily Mail every day. <laughs> and you, you don't want to miss that opportunity if and when it arrives. Thank you very much. Thank you.